Hello, welcome to chapter 10. This is the chapter on uh, classroom discipline by Barbara Coloroso uh, on where discipline is involved with instruction. Uh, Coloroso's method is called interdiscipline. It's another phrase for self-discipline, but interdiscipline meaning the student and the, the discipline and the point comes from within the student. Uh, the objectives here, we're going to look at the concept called the second point here, reconciliatory justice. That uh, that implies that there is something is reconciled, something is all put together so that there's a, a bow tied on the end of the the problem. And we'll talk about that and the six critical life messages that a teacher uh, should convey to students and students should feel this. We're going to look at three different types of classrooms, jellyfish, brick wall, and backbone, and I bet you probably can match up that with the three types of teachers we discussed earlier in earlier chapters. So we're going to look at that and some techniques for applying it into the classroom and differentiate between what we call punishment versus discipline. Um, I'm going to work backwards on this line. We're going to start with the star at the bottom there. Students must be taught how to think, not what to think. I think that's one of the key points here. In interdiscipline, obviously, the student needs to learn what the th thought process is, is that I need, to go, I need to go through in order to reach the conclusion that I'm looking for, uh, not just exactly what I need to think. The how will cover a multitude of situations. The what may only cover one specific type of, of situation. Next is that problem solving is the key to developing uh, interdiscipline. Problem solving. Solving the problem that occurred in the classroom, that's the key to developing self-discipline, interdiscipline. And the top uh, dark blue dot there says development of interdiscipline is more important than traditional classroom control. This is Coloroso's three main points. That interdiscipline is more important to develop than keeping traditional classroom control. That uh, problem solving is the key to, solve, to uh, learning interdiscipline and that students need to talk how to think. Let's go on. Here are the six messages and I believe these messages are critical for teachers to understand. Students need to feel this from you regardless of whether you truly were thinking about that at the time but you need to find a way to convey this message over to the students. I believe in you. I trust you. I know you can handle this. And I have sat next to a student who was struggling with a problem in class. And I've said those phrases to them. You could see the weight left off their shoulders in one aspect when they say, I believe you can get this. I know that you can do this. And I'm going to trust you to work this out together. You and I, we're going to solve this problem together. They need to know they're listened to. Very often at the beginning of a class, students will come to the teacher's desk while you're trying to fill out your, fill out your lunch report or attendance report. And they want to tell you something. They just can't wait. Uh, Try not to fall into the very easy pit of, uh, what is it, honey? And then put your head right back down to what it's you're doing. And you're still working with your ear toward them. And you say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then you barely look at them and say, oh, that's great. And they go on back. They know they haven't been truly listened to. Look them in the eye and stop just a second and listen to what they've got to say. Or if you don't have time to listen to them, say, I need, I, I need a few minutes to finish this. I'll listen to you in just a moment. And then take the moment and let them really feel like they're listened to. Um, this business that you're cared for is implied by little comments that you can make to a student. Ask them about something that you know about that happened in their family that they had told you before. I hear your mama has a new baby. How's she doing? How's the little baby? You like the baby? Something that lets them know that you're personally interested in them as a student and as a person. And they need to feel that they're important to you as a teacher. So get those six messages across to a student. It'll cut many of your problems in half because it'll establish a better relationship between you and your student. Here's the jellyfish classroom. And I think those points there pretty well define themselves. It's the one where nobody knows what to expect and things are pretty much arbitrary. Depends on a teacher. This is a teacher who probably doesn't know from themselves what to expect. So they haven't defined their kind of message. In the punishment side, and it may even in the, go into the side of the opposite of punishment, being overly favorable toward a student. But very often you'll find, I have seen teachers who punished one gender more than another. Uh, I've known of teachers who were harder on the boys in the class or harder on the girls in the class. Uh, I've heard teachers say to another teacher, oh, the boys in her class get away with anything because she just, she just loves boys. Or the girls get a, don't get away with anything, that kind of thing. That's a clue right there that it's leaning toward a jellyfish classroom. Some other personal characteristic. Frankly, it's difficult sometimes to really get personal and to show that you care about a student if they don't smell good. 
if they don't behave, if they don't have the kind of personality that you particularly care or that clicks with you. Uh, if they have uh, uh, weight problems, if they're grossly underweight or grossly overweight or something like that, if there's a personal visual characteristic or something, those things can affect some teachers in terms of how they either punish or don't punish a student. So be aware of that and self-monitor yourself. Brick wall classroom. This is the hard core dictator type uh, teacher. And you've probably been in a classroom with that kind of teacher where Octung, it's my way or the highway, get out of my way. Where the rules are used to intimidate and manipulate the students to do things. Teachers obviously who provide physical threats for students don't last very long in the classroom and we see headline after headline where some teachers have been dismissed from a school because of the physical threats or actual physical punishment. Uh, humiliation is one of those things that are so subtle and bribery is probably the easiest one to fall into and it doesn't have to take a I'll give you a dollar process it can be if you guys can just sit still for five more minutes we'll finish this lesson and then you can go outside that is a bribe so be aware of bribing your students in order to get them to do the behavior because they still haven't learned to behave the way they ought to once again that's teaching them what to think not how to think. Now the backbone classroom obviously is the one that you want to desire to be. And I like the backbone example because it means the background, backbone is firm and stiff but it's flexible when the process demands it. So and that's the way we should be as teachers. We should have a firm and solid set to, to begin with. But if something really requires you to bend, then be able to bend with it so that not bending becomes a less desirable situation where students are given second chances and maybe another second chance. Now I understand the process and the, the default of not giving of giving students too many second chances but once again they're not looking for a friend in you they're looking for someone to guide them the way to behave so make sure you do that. And the last part at the bottom of the, of the page is one of those things that uh, many teachers have to uh, are insecure about modeling for their students and that is modeling the desired behavior. If you want your student to get to class on time, you should be in class on time or early. If you want the student to have their homework done, then you need to have your your papers graded on time and you need to have your lessons prepared on time. You don't need to come in that morning to run off papers for that day. And that's the biggest pit that teachers fall into. Now that doesn't mean that every now and then you get one set of pages short or something like that. But if everybody's in the copy room ahead of you, you may not have time enough to get it done and then you're behind. So it always helps to come into class prepared. Uh, look at mistakes as an opportunity to learn. It's one of those, as we talked about earlier, the teachable moments where you can actually teach a student by their mistake. Even if you make a 99 on a test, the one point that you missed is probably the point that you actually remember from that test. And very often mistakes are make learning something different or something new easier to learn because you understand the importance of knowing it. And as I said at the bottom, make sure you're modeling the correct behaviors. Let's look at discipline in a backbone classroom. The whole point here, discipline or teaching students how to behave, is different from punishment, which is meeting out something that's an after the fact point. It should involve things that are related to real world consequences whenever you can or interventions in order to, to change their behavior before it gets too bad, or a combination of the both, depending, depending on what your judgment is on this process. Make sure that the emphasis is on discipline and not on punishment. Here are the four points about this. Coloroso says, show the children what they've done wrong. Now, the discipline part will help the, either by having set up rules or having discussed something so that they you can outline it for them. Then give them ownership of the problem by making them confess it to you. Now you tell me what it is you did wrong. That's going to be tough to get out of them, but and very often it starts with the, the shoulder shrug. If you can wait them out, tell them, we'll sit here until you tell me what it is you did wrong. Once they will confess that, it becomes a major psychological moment. So make sure that you do that. And then uh, give them a way to solve the problem. Ask them to, to, 
suggest some solutions. Ask the offended person to suggest some solutions. Or you can use guided questions to help them come up with the solutions. But let them come up with ways that the problem can be solved. The whole point of leaving their dignity intact is to make sure that throughout this process you don't attack the person. You look at and you address the behavior, not the person. Uh, the bottom part of this is the key to this one page here. Make sure the actions and the consequences match. If they do something that's a mild offense, make the consequence be a mild consequence. Unless it's the 15th time they've done it, then maybe you need to step it up. You probably needed to have stepped it up quite a time before that. Sometimes real world consequences are the things that will happen naturally. Or you can make it reasonable consequences that are related to the action. So color also says it can be either one and it's your choice. Just make sure that the consequences match what the offense was. And color also provides us with this four letter acronym to help us remember this. Ask yourself, is it reasonable? Is it fairly simple to do? Is it going to be valuable to this student as a learning tool? Is it practical for me to implement? If the consequence you come up with, even if it's a real world consequence, if it fits the RSVP plan, reasonable, it's simple, it's valuable, and it's practical, then I don't have to spend a lot of time worrying about it. Execute it. Let it happen. There are some tips on page 184 and 186 at the top. These are good tips to, to, to read about um, relationships between parents and, I mean, between teachers and students. And ask yourself, do I read in these examples, I am their friend? Because I believe that students are not necessarily looking for a friend, a BFF, if you will. They're looking for a leader, a guide, someone to encourage them. They're looking for a cheerleader. If they want a friend, they'll have friends at their age. So the answer is, yes, I'm looking to be friendly, but they don't need me for a friend. So keep that in mind whenever you're dealing with your students. The downsides of this by students is that when they try to con you, is that they'll beg, they'll bribe, they become expert. I promise I'll never ever not come in with my homework. I'll do my homework twice every day from now on if you just won't do this because if, if you give me the punishment on this, I don't get to go on the football team. I don't get to go to the game. I get to, I don't get to stay on the cheerleading team. I, I don't get to go in the band. I don't get to go on the field trip. No, please, please, please. And then they start weeping and wailing. And if that doesn't work, they may show that they're angered. Or you just don't care, you're just not fair, and blah, blah, blah. They want to try to provoke a response out of you. And if they see that it works, guess what? It gets to happen again. If not, once you've stuck to your guns, then the big, the lower lip comes out and they'll soak, pout, carry on. Um, because they're, once again, have not, if you have not made them admit what it is they did wrong, then these things will happen. So make sure you don't allow that process to get that far. But if your consequence still fits the RSVP process, let it ride. In other words, no whining. Shouldn't happen. So, let's look at the rules setting. Uh, show up on time. Be prepared. Do your assignments. Respect your own and others. Isn't this the same rules that we as teachers should have to do? We should show up on time. We should have our lessons prepared, including running off copies of stuff they need. We should do our assignments. In other words, we should continue to grade our papers in a reasonable amount of time and get the grades back. Do you have respect for the student's space? Or are you in their face all the time? Then why wonder when they're, your, they're in your face and not respecting your space? The whole point is the example. Solving problems. This is like the scientific method of where you identify the problem, you make a hypothesis, you uh, test the hypothesis, and then you generate which one of those works. Look at these. You identify and define the problem. You list the possible solutions, the hypotheses. Evaluate the, op the options. In other words, test these for which one's going to be the best. Choose one, then make a plan for that to happen. And then once you've all gone through that process, then reevaluate. Do the Dr. Phil question, how'd that work for me? Now, as a teacher, you can then refine your whole process every time you go through this process, every time making yourself a little better of a teacher and a little better at helping students solve problems. Remember these six points. Reconciliatory justice. This is once a problem has happened. And Colorado divides it basically into three large categories. The first one being restitution. If a student steals a pencil, then that student owes the other student a pencil, or you a pencil, or something. Whatever's done. Let the concept of you fix you break it, you fix it, or you stole it, you return it process come into fine to play here. That's the first part that needs to happen. Next, then we have to resolve the whole problem identify, help the students, because we just talked about that in, in the six steps, 
uh, find ways to prevent this from happening again. Okay, Johnny, the next time you're out of pencils or you've broken your pencil point, what are some options that you can do in order to solve this without stealing Susie's pencil instead of asking her, could you borrow her pencil or did she have an extra she could loan you? That's different. So find some way to prevent the situation from happening again. But once you've done all that, it is important that both parties go away feeling that there's been a catharsis, a clearing of the air, that you've healed the hurt caused so that both parties can kind of go, go away and heal. The healing can begin. A lot of teachers forget this part. I think they get along and they finally get some punishment meted out, that kind of thing, and they about it, identified what you're going to do in the process. But it's very important that you let the one who's been harmed let you know they're okay too. And the one who gets the consequence for the misbehavior needs to let you know they understand why they're getting it and they're okay with that. And now they are more secure because you helped them to identify what to do differently the next time. I like this thing called an apology of action. This is a physical thing that a student has to do to apologize. It is not that ubiquitous, often heard, I'm sorry. And then I even look him in the face and go, sorry. Well, you can barely hear it. The reason why they don't want to admit that is that same process of making them admit they've done something wrong. They need to do some sort of action. If that is to physically take the pencil and put it on their desk or put it in their hand, fine, let them do that. If they have broken something, you make it sweep it up and, and you take it in their hands, you take them to take it over to the trash can and let them dump it in the trash can so they can see they've broken somebody's something. So they know what they have to replace. Something like that. Let them do an action. So then uh, when they bring something back to replace it, they have to then physically take it and place it in the hands of the offended person. That helps to ease the whole process from the hurt feelings of the, of the offense. It also allows the one who's been hurt to say, yes, this satisfies me too. The one who's been offended, the one who had his pencil stolen or his book torn up or something like that. If the replacement satisfies them, then this person's okay and that person, the offender is okay and everybody can take a deep breath and clear the air. That is so important to finish it. Color also, also talks about class meetings as being an important way to solve class-wide problems. Remember, it's not one or two person or three person or even four person problems. If it's occurring only between those three or four people, which very often happens with family squabbles, neighborhood squabbles, but if it's something that's occurring throughout the class and sprinkling things, that's the time for a class meeting. A meeting. And it helps to reduce the stress because as a class we identify how to solve the problem and how to uh, ease the hurt or the mistake so that nobody gets punished anymore. You can see the tension, you can literally feel it be lifted off the class. They're like, okay, I know what to do now. It teaches the democratic process too by going through the problem solving process. We'll talk about that democracy business more later in another chapter. So uh, here's the way to be able to, if you're going to have classroom meetings, do this. First of all, you have to identify what the problem is, and it needs to be important enough for the whole class to be able to deal with. You as a teacher need to be neutral on the process. You need to bring it up and say, what ways can we solve this? And provide a safe atmosphere for the offenders as well as the offended to be able to speak up in the classroom without other people putting them down, uh, making other problems happening. If you can provide those, that's that's the basis for your classroom meeting. Now, the downside of this, actually the upside of this first, is uh, teachers say that students are worth the effort it takes to make them responsible, to make them resourceful and caring individuals. That's not tested on TCAPs and NCLB, but is it not part of our basis as teachers in education, those of us in education? To help develop a, a better functioning society, which is our big umbrella cause of why we have education in the first place. The second part here says teachers shouldn't treat children in ways they don't want to be treated. Imagine that. If you don't want students yelling at you, then don't yell at your students. If you don't want students picking at you and trying to put you down for something you've misstated in the classroom, then you shouldn't be guilty of that either. 
The whole process is we don't need to treat children in ways they wouldn't want to be treated themselves. The last part says, whatever we do when we intervene, it must not criticize the person. It should criticize, criticize the action. We're addressing the actions done, not the student's dignity. Let's move on. Now, there are some folks who, who say that consequences are consequences, you know, that it's just punishment light. But I disagree totally. I think punishment's an after-the-fact um, expression of anger, basically. Whereas consequences help the students learn something. I don't know that punishment's really intent on that. I know those teachers who are pressed for time in the classroom say that this whole process of time, of uh, problem solving and going through the testing hypotheses and the solutions and the, all the business in there is just too time consuming. I suggest to you that the four or six minutes or nine minutes or whatever it takes to be able to solve this once or twice or three times benefits you in the long run many more times by time saved where the problems just don't occur anymore. So it may take time, more time initially, but in the long run the benefit is much more worth it. Those that say, it's the same folks who talk say that takes away from instructional time. Yes, but you gain instructional time once you've taught the students how to be able to deal with this. But some see this process as necessary to the development of a moral center and a sense of personal responsibility. And I think I've affected, I've, I've implied that throughout this lecture. And that we're showing the students a moral center of how to behave and how to consider one another as human beings. And that we all have a personal responsibility in uh, running our class and in our dealing with each other in our classroom community. So I'm not sure that that's a weakness. A few questions here you might want to look at these next few ones. That developing interdiscipline in students is more important than maintaining traditional classroom control. Do you agree? Now Coloroso says this. Do you agree? Do you disagree? I may want to ask this question in class and see what you think. And you're welcome to take either side of this. Developing self-discipline, I'm changing the word, developing self-discipline in students is more important than maintaining traditional classroom control. Because I know I have a lot of traditionalists in my classroom. And if you agree that way, explain your thinking. Uh, I, the traditional classroom control being more like Cantor. Rules, consequences, uh, that kind of process. The next question to talk about is that problem solving is the key to developing dis interdiscipline. Do you agree? And what do you mean by problem solving? I just talked about the process. Is that the key to a student's learning self-discipline? Third question. What does this process mean about teaching students how to think? What do you think it means teaching students how to think, not what to think? Uh, I wonder sometimes if teachers go through this and they see this line. Let's talk about that in class and see if you can outline a few of those processes. So that wraps up chapter 10, and I usually do chapter 10 and chapter 11, if not in the same class, very in very brief times uh, following each other, because these are two short but very important chapters. So we're going with chapter 11 next. Uh, good luck. Look at the, the uh, terms at the end of the chapter in chapter 10, and we'll go on with chapter 11 next. See you. Bye.